Hi everyone, welcome to episode 14 of This Week in Finance. So we've been at this for 14 weeks, that means a little over one quarter. There are 13 weeks in a quarter. 13 times four is 52. So this is our 14th week, which uh, I think is pretty incredible. Anyway, thanks for making this a success. The stock market um, is pretty boring, um, which is, is rare. Um, but we're what in now the tenth year of an expansion or ninth year of an expansion. Um, the only thing that was really interesting to me is that bonds uh, are on this huge rally uh, because there's no inflation to be had anywhere in the world, which is a little bit weird. Um, the one thing I noticed is the TED spread has dropped to uh, an all-time low, so basically banks. Or you can borrow overnight money from a bank if, if you're mostly if you're a bank for almost nothing. So you can see here how the TED spread has dropped um, dramatically, and and to me that means there's almost no stress in the financial system. Uh, 15 basis points annualized rate um, to borrow money from say J.P. Morgan to Bank of America or something like that. And it's been a long, long time since uh, we've had rates that low, um, and then. If you think about um, on where unemployment is, if you think about where inflation is, um, where stocks are, and where the volatility is, um, pretty much we're in a perfect, kind of harmonious place. Um, you have a pretty normal yield curve where you have um, TED spread for overnight is 0 0.15, or, or I should say TED spread is really LIBOR minus um, Fed funds, right? Or I'm sorry, LIBOR minus treasuries. So um, that's close to zero. LIBOR is, is 1.31. That's a three month LIBOR if you're curious. And then the uh, twos and tens are all in, it's actually almost perfect. You have twos at 1%, tens at 2%, triple A bonds at 3.6, and, and B bonds at 4.3 and junk a little bit higher. So it's kind of like a the financial under structure of the market is always really important to me. Um, I'm not a macro person, uh, as we were joking about earlier, but I do care about the financial structure of the market because it does impact on things like loans and leverage and, and high yield bonds, things that I do use, um, and equity windows, which is kind of the extreme far end of a curve if you can raise money on a speculative company. For instance, in 08 or 09, there's no IPOs because people have trouble financing normal things, let alone buying speculative uh, IPOs. So sometimes if you see the, the IPO window open, some people use that phrase, the window is open to do an IPO for a, a biotech or a tech company that doesn't have much earnings or neg negative earnings, it sort of tells you we're in a speculative environment. But we're in a speculative environment without any um, bubble-like behavior. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second. but. Everything is like very normal, um, which for speculators is, is a reason to be bullish. Um, most of the time markets don't go from good to uh, bad. They go from good to great to bubblicious to bad. <laughs> um, there's something called Elliott Wave Theory that I encourage you to read about and um, human psychology tends to repeat itself. Now, um, quant funds and other instruments have maybe made volatility a thing of the past, but I, I personally don't think that's going to be true. Um, anyway, Bitcoin has had this astounding dip and this astounding recovery. Again, it's kind of this cancerous um, asset class, um, but um, you know we'll kind of see what, what happens there. Um, the dollar is, is falling apart, again, mostly because there's no inflation here and there's this perception that there's a little bit more inflation elsewhere, but I'm not so sure that that's true either. Pardon me. Nevertheless, the um, that's sort of what's happening there. Um, the DAC sold off last week quite a bit, so that was kind of interesting. Um, but um, yeah, really good sort of fundamental macroeconomic situation. Tech continues to to kick butt. Um, so the fact money has nowhere to go and, and everything's relatively cheap, I think, means that um, the market will continue to all markets will continue to rise, as scary as it sounds. So one stock I've been short for a while, we'll go from the very macro to the very micro, is this company called Neurotrope. And this has uh, mostly been a meme of a company 
um, some people for whatever reason were excited by it. Um, it's some kind of a micro cap stock, but um, one of my partners was really smart. He shorted it uh, right before the stock fell, and I'm shorting it sort of since the stock has fallen. So he's he's smarter than I am, and one day I'll be working for him. But um, either way, um, this is a company with an Alzheimer's drug, and you can see, yeah, well, we at least caught this move. Um, I at least got that move. I'm glad that he got that move. But uh, this is a company that supposedly is an Alzheimer's drug, and, and one of the interesting things about this company is you think it has a small market cap, but it has all these warrants that are in the money. So it still has over 100 million market cap. Um, and uh, I think it is a little too late. Um, this, But anyway, the point is when it was $25 a share, it had a market cap of, say, um, you know, 200, 300 million, which um, very few hedge funds, I think, caught on to. And we were lucky to be shorted. Um, it's a five employee company, as you can see here. They have an office uh, across the street at WeWork. Um, I think I have more employees that take care of my house and my cat than this Alzheimer's company. And unfortunately, they're not worth uh, $43.6 million, although I think their scientific output is higher than these guys. Anyway, they had their data presented. And um, here you can see they had this 20 microgram dose and this uh, 40 microgram dose. And this is of a, something called bryostatin, which isn't uh, a real thing. And anyway, um, this uh, scale, which is not commonly used in Alzheimer's, by the way, um, uh, you can see here at week five, um, the drug had this uh, plus three, um, three points um, from baseline, I guess, or this might be placebo subtracted. And the p-value failed to meet, but the company press released it as positive anyway. The stock went down, as you can see, but it didn't go down all the way. And at week nine and week 13, um, the efficacy quote unquote signal was lost. And then with just double the dose of the drug, there was no efficacy signal whatsoever. So the company was actually hoping for a 6.5 point benefit, which was in their slide deck. Um, so the fact that they kind of got, I don't know, one, if you're lucky, they got one point, tells you something and obviously not statistically significant. So a pretty good, uh, pretty good short there. I think it's probably time to cover um, cover this one, um, but very interesting. Vertex uh, shocked the world a little bit with some uh, positive uh, data here in cystic fibrosis. They have uh, three, four new drugs, 440, 152, and 659. I think they have more than that as well. And that's in addition to the two drugs they have FDA approved and another drug called 661 that is almost FDA approved. So yeah, supposedly efficacy went down, but really when you see something like this in, in so-called inverted, inverted inverted uh, dose curve usually means drug doesn't work um, because you can reject the hypothesis that double the dose somehow results in less efficacy. There's, that almost never happens in medicine. Um, at worst, doubling the dose will have a saturation point where you won't get maybe more incremental efficacy um, like you can take as many Tylenol as you want or as many Claritin as you want, but you're not going to get a linear dose curve. You'll get some saturation, but you won't get it to go the other way around. So it's pretty easy to reject uh, an explanation that would account for this. And it's more easy to accept, uh, easily accept that the drug just isn't doing anything. Anyway, you can't do that with Vertex. So <laughs> let's take a look at this data. Uh, it's amazing how, how, how tiny uh, these studies were and they resulted in well, probably a $10 billion increase to Vertex's market cap. Um, let's see, it's a 250 million shares outstanding. So yeah, maybe a 5 billion increase to their market cap. The stock went from 130 to 160. So it went up $30. So yeah, maybe 6 billion market cap. So it was 30 something billion. Now it's a $40 billion company. And they only did 40, uh, 40 patient studies. So. Uh, this is sort of the miracle of medicine, right? They had in placebo, these are cystic fibrosis patients. This is not too clear if you don't know this lingo, but uh, this is 47 cystic fibrosis patients with uh, uh, F508 deletion. So this is the 508th amino acid of a protein called CFTR. And then a minimal um, uh, deletion. So basically they, they have one allele, you always have two alleles of any protein. Um, think of them as one is from your mother and one is from your father. Uh, but one is the F508 deletion, which results in this weird mutated cystic fibrosis protein. 
and the other is one that doesn't result in any protein. And this drug is, is VX440 plus Tazacaftor, which is 661, and uh, Ivacaftor, which is uh, Kaleidico. And then, so they gave triple placebo, uh, and they saw the lung, this is a forced expiratory volume. So literally, <sighs> how much you can blow out expiratory volume. Um, if you've ever been a pulmonologist, you blow into this tube, and it's FEV in one second. So how, how hard can you blow out how, as in one second? And at day 29, placebo patients got one point, but at 200 milligrams and 600 milligrams, they got 10 points of FEV1 and 12 points of FEV1 for this dose, 6600 mg dose. So really almost a miracle, I would say. People with cystic fibrosis um, have decreased lung function until they die. So this is a really remarkable, um, unbelievable kind of success and kind of what the biotech industry is all about. Um, uh, the 26 patient uh, uh, 440 uh, data had a similar, sort of similar impact. I forgot what the, oh yeah, these were in uh, um, a biallelic uh, F508, uh, F508 del deletion patients. This is sometimes called homozygous. This is a heterozygous patient. Um, so if you do the model, uh, the valuation implies that you get um, revenue of about $6 billion. So the, the market cap, like I said, is about $41 billion. This is basically all Vertex has. So it's about, what, eight, seven times, seven times peak sales of $6 billion. So right now they're doing one-ish, maybe two-ish billion dollars. Let's take a look. I had my model open, but... Uh, Put it away for a second. Yeah, they'll do about two billion this year. That's what I thought. So revenue is going to triple, and then even then, I think the stock isn't quite worth that much. Uh, there is competition. I don't think they're um, the only game in town. There'll probably be a cystic fibrosis gene therapy at some point. Um, maybe they can get to ten or twelve billion dollars, which is the, what they would need to do for this to be a great long. But man, this is one um, kind of a very valuable company relative to kind of you know what their what their market cap is so anyway best of luck to them of course and a great result but uh, maybe they can get to eight eight billion or, or more so at the way fev one works is this is an absolute change so people with normal um normal fev1 are in the 80 i want to say 80 range and then um people with cystic fibrosis progressively decline from 80 to like 40 and after 40 i think you're pretty much dead um, so you lose like five points a year or something like that. I, f I forget exactly when I was uh, following this market more carefully. I was watching it very, very carefully, but it's, it's a really debilitating illness. So to, to regain that uh, lung function back is, is just like incredible. And if you watch probably one of the most um, inspirational videos I've ever seen is um, the story of Kaleidico. And there's a book about it called uh, The Antidote, which if you want to learn more about pharmaceuticals, it's a fantastic book. Um, but Kaleidico, um, there's a, some kind of a video here about Kaleidico. Um, there's been a lot, I guess, since then. A lot of people take their, uh, take their uh, it's such a miracle drug. People take the uh, videos of them taking it, which is pretty, pretty amazing. Um, it really is a miracle when it came out. But now Vertex is kind of outdoing themselves. Anyway, there's there's a great video about Kaleidico that was done pretty professionally and, and kind of cool. And um, yeah, I can't find it at the moment, but uh, here it is. It's called Adding Tomorrows. And it's um, it's about uh, the story of how this, um, this drug got approved. So anyway, that's, that's what's going on with Vertex, so. All right, so earnings season is back. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I just looked at, spent the day looking at um, a handful of, uh, listening to a handful of conference calls, some of you may have seen it. Um, um, J&J and Novartis uh, were pretty non-eventful. The only things that I thought was kind of interesting is J&J said that Remicade would not um, fall that quickly, which seemed like uh, pretty wishful thinking. Um, but it bodes well for Humira and Enbrel, obviously. But again, it seemed like wishful thinking to me. I think Remicade, Humira, Enbrel, they're all gonna drop dramatically when all the biosimilars get approved. 
um, it's one of the biggest costs to, to healthcare. By us, um, there are these old old antibodies, and we've learned a lot about how to make antibodies over the last um, 20, 30 years. And I think it should be pretty trivial to get them to be cheaper. Um, so we'll kind of see what happens there. Novartis um, had a fine company as a pharmaceutical company, but their generics business, uh, the brand business, but the generics business was pretty bad. And I think that there's going to be, you know, continued uh, issues with uh, the generic industry for the next few quarters. But I think I think they'll come out the other end. Uh, again, what exactly is driving generic pressures and where this business is going? Nobody's really sure, but it's definitely um, going to be somewhat uh, interesting. UNH had a good quarter. This is the biggest health insurance company, United Healthcare. I'm starting to follow these companies a little more closely. I think they're at peak cycle. Um, conditions are about as perfect as it can get. Um, you've got the Trump presidency. Um, you know, they always say sell when things are good, right? And um, the company is as, is as big as they can get. They can't grow enrollment anymore. Um, and you have um, healthcare costs at a fever pitch. You know, it never has been louder that the healthcare has to be, um, costs have to get cut. And these guys basically live in a cost plus world, right? They live in a 20% cost margin world. So I personally think, I've never seen UNH, I and mean, it's worth almost $200 billion. And I personally think, you know, this could be a good time to start to short it. Um, conceptually, um, I'm not sure that this company adds that much economic value to anybody. And, um, you know, I have to be careful what I say because they pay for all my medicines. But at the same time, um, just as a as a as an industry, I'm not sure what the HMOs do exactly. Um, so uh, I'm not sure that our costs are going down. And uh, obviously, they organize healthcare spend, but at the same time, you know, they're they're whether it's social social medicine or, or other things that can change um, the cost curve. I'm not sure that UNH is is the solution. So we'll see. Um, I listened to Netflix's um, earnings call. I thought that was super interesting. Um, the, um, um, you know, it's a fascinating company. They, how should I put it? Let me, let me pull up the model because it's so interesting. They basically, in many ways, seem like, um, um, seem like they're, it's the biggest short in the world. But when you dig into it, it's actually a very interesting company. Let me sort of show you what I mean. You can see the company's growing earnings repeatedly, but um, cash flow is negative, their, their net income is close to zero, right? Um, and they're, they've been accruing lots of additional debt. But if you look at the actual um, US business and sort of by itself, the picture becomes very, very different. So you have 45% gross margin, which is pretty amazing. And then if you take the, the marketing spend, which is basically flattish, you know, it's, it's not too flat, but it's it's really kind of de minimis. Um, you still have maybe a billion in, in trailing six month cash flow, so two billion in trailing 12 month cash flow, more than two billion, and that's growing rapidly. So if you look at um, the enterprise value, which is 72 billion, um, that's not you know the most irrational quote unquote multiple 35 times for something that's growing, uh, um, growing really rapidly. Um, let's see what the growth rate is. I don't know, that looks like 20%. So that's not crazy, 25%. Um, so that's not totally, totally crazy. It's, it's pretty expensive, obviously, since this is EBITDA, not, um, uh, not anything else, and not post-tax. And it's not all costs, it's just marketing. Um, so you have to include G&A and, and R&D and other things. But you know, this gives you an interesting picture of the business. Um, and then on the international side, you kind of have a similar dynamic, except you could see this do even better. You have um, um, gross margins going from kind of close to zero to now a blended peak of 16% with, with a, quite a lot of growth, 50% revenue growth that probably won't slow down for some time. So you can kind of see this company growing into uh, kind of what uh, everyone's hoping they'll become. Um, the reason you would isolate the American business is because the international business started after, and the international business is still growing at what the American business was growing many years ago. So you can you can kind of see the international get to a two, three, four billion dollar revenue and peak margins of forty five percent. You're talking about an incremental, say two billion dollars of cash flow. So at two point five, um, probably more than two billion of cash flow uh, annually. 
So you could be looking at, so two billion there, two billion there makes sort of maybe four to six billion peak cash flow, which would make it only 10 times earnings, which is very, very reasonable. So anyway, the point is um, uh, Netflix is a pretty, really, really, really tough to understand company. And uh, typically in situations like this, especially with the 70 billion cap, I mean, maybe it'll go to 100 or 150 billion cap, but um, I prefer not to worry about this. I probably should have bought it way back when, when Icon bought it, but again, I wasn't as focused maybe on it as possible. I listened to the Microsoft and SAP and IBM calls. Again, I'm, I started a software company that, these are obviously the biggest, um, the biggest companies in the world in software, but it's, it's sort of uh, fun for me to listen to them. And you know, no surprises that cloud is, is pretty much anyone, the only thing anyone cares about. IBM's having a tough time being sort of a consulting company. They should probably spin off uh, their businesses. I know they think that they get a lot of um, sort of benefit from having uh, all of it under one roof. But uh, all of these companies, uh, not all of them, but certainly IBM and Microsoft have the same problem of a bunch of really slow growing businesses and a bunch of really um, fast growing businesses and they, they, they're kind of obscured when they're mushed together. It's not a big problem for Microsoft because it's, less of, it's just less of their businesses slow growing. But for IBM, it's, it's, it's really problematic. So um, I don't think IBM, I agree with some of the comments here that, that IBM software isn't very good. Uh, their mainframe business is still, uh, I think I want to say two thirds of earnings. So they have a long ways to go and they really want kind of cloud to be their definition. But the problem is they're, they're far from that. SAP had a, had a great quarter, uh, but again, all the valuations sort of reflect um, all of these companies. So even though Microsoft beat and then they, they guided low for next quarter, all these companies kind of had very uh, lackluster responses. Only Netflix really shocked and awed. So we'll see more earnings next week. I missed a couple reports. Uh, Visa and a few others reported, so that'll be that. All right, so um, July is almost done. Uh, maybe one more week in July. And uh, here are the stocks, uh, in healthcare at least, that have risen quite a bit for the month. Uh, there's our friend Neurotrope. is the third worst performer in biotech, which makes me very happy since it was, I think, our biggest short. So you couldn't, literally could not have uh, called it better. Um, obviously, if you had all the other ones, that'd be great too. But uh, Alamira um, is an interesting long, I think, down here. I haven't touched it yet, but um, that was a really interesting blow up. None of the other, these are all really small cap companies. None of these are really too interesting to me. On the long side, we had Unicure, which had this perplexing large um, move. Oh, the secret short dropped quite a bit. Um, I won't say how much or you'd figure out what it was, but it's a little tricky when your secret short drops, uh, or when your short drops because you want to add more, but it's a little bit uh, tricky. A lot of these are small caps, but you can see um, Vertex had a really big move. Again, uh, tough to buy that stock. I wanted to buy Sarepta, but I was in the middle of a lot of things last week. As some of you know, Fold had a pretty remarkable situation. Arena's uh, new data is interesting, and obviously we own some Unicure, so pretty good month for us. Um, let's look at the current opinions, and then we'll look at the portfolio. So Alamira, I mentioned last time, I think is kind of interesting on the long side. So is Sarepta, and so is Ultragenics. I finally did some reviews of all these companies. Um, I like most of them. Um, Nectar looks like a great, great short. Like I, I don't understand why this company is worth $1 billion, let alone $3 billion. It's uh, trading for $3 billion right now. I mentioned UNH, um, so those are a couple of additions of new ideas I'm working on, about five, five new stocks. Um, I'll probably add some more to, to my uh, list. Uh, someone showed me MEIP, which um, is sort of a left for dead company that actually could be kind of interesting. Um, anyway, we'll, we'll work on those when we get some time. Um, all right, the portfolio had an amazing uh, week. A lot of you were messaging me during the week about it. I'm very happy I could provide you with some um, in investment success. Uh, you know, nothing makes me happier than watching people make money, whether it's uh, working with me as an entrepreneur or making money investing. So we're up 2% for the week, bringing our year to date to 9%. I mentioned in the start that we're 13 weeks, um, 13 weeks in. I still have to evaluate Nectar, but it looks really good. And I know the company from my past. Um, so we're about 13 weeks in, we're already up 9%, which, um, and that's on 50% growth. So if you, um, if you did the math, um, really, 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 uh, lucky here. Um, you know, it's, it's been a amazing run. So, um, if we, if you annualize it, 
um, for the four quarters, right? We only did one quarter. It's sort of fun to do this. Um, we'd be up 36%, and then for the gross exposure is only 48%, we'd have to double that as well. So we're, we're run, running at a 73, 72, 73% annual rate, uh, which again, I will never, we will not keep up that pace, I don't think. Uh, you always want to try, but like I said, um, we will not never do that well in the, in, in, you know, on, a con on a constant basis. You might have one quarter where you do really well, and I'm lucky that the first quarter we did this investment series, we did really well, but trust me that in three months or six months, there'll be some three month period where we do really poorly and you're gonna say, oh, that Martin guy is such an idiot, why would I ever watch or listen to him? But you know, we're very, very lucky that um, the first quarter is, uh, of, of investing together, so to speak, has, has done uh, very, very well. Um, I think, uh, so I did some research, uh, I think Acadia is having a bad quarter they just launched a drug called Nuclazid, and I have a lot of concerns about the medicine other than the new launch, which is I think what's everyone, on everyone's mind, but I think that their Q2 results will be a little bit disappointing. Um, this is based on my read of just IMS data, um, nothing too special there, but um, um, sort of semi-public information. IMS is a vendor that um, sells prescription data, Wall Street gets it, so it's, it's public to, to, to Wall Street certainly, uh, but it's not widely publicized. And I, I, my, my accounting of the Acadia launch is that they'll miss, they'll miss numbers. Uh, and again, it's, it's, uh, it's a pretty, that comports with my general theory of the company, which is that it's overvalued, and I think there's some other issues that have not come to light yet. Um, Neurotrope, again, has dropped dramatically. It's time to probably cover and get out. Um, Ironwood uh, had some bad data. We'll talk about it later. That could could be a, a, a short to grow to double or triple the current size. The social media shorts are doing well. Um, I'm excited to have them do well. Um, so we'll see what happens there. The secret short with the hidden camera. Um, my my team is still working on exposing this company. It'll be quite an Academy Award winning performance if we can get them on hidden camera. That'd be uh, pretty amazing. Twitter was up for the week, obviously. I'm um, short Twitter. Um, so that's why it's a negative uh, position in my portfolio. It's, you're short. When you're short something, it's a negative position. And Twitter was up, uh, looks like about 2%. Um, so anyway, on the long side, I did the same research for Alexion and Regeneron. And uh, I think um, Alexion is... Uh, is uh, having a really, really good quarter, despite the Bloomberg fake news. So having said that, you know, the stock's gone from, a, a lot of people ask me if it's time to sell Alexion, the stock's gone from 100 to um, 130. And I think at 100, I basically was asking my, my uh, I would tell anybody, I would tell, I tell some stranger on the street to go buy Alexion. So now that it's kind of come back up um, very quickly, just in a month or two, it might be time to start selling Alexion. Um, I'm not sure just because they had a good quarter the stock's going to go up. I think that's what the market's sort of expecting. And if you think Vertex is expensive, you know, Lexion's not that cheap at a $30 billion now. Uh, at $20 billion, it was it was really cheap. But at $30 billion, you know, I, I, I can certainly make the case it's worth $50 billion still. But, um, you know, markets are, are uh, kind of uh, tricky and, you know, it, it's a good return pretty quickly, so it might be time to to lay off. Gilead's starting to recover as well, which I like. Um, you definitely like to see this uh, as an investor. Regeneron, I think they're having a pretty good quarter for Dupixent, but again, this is probably the, the, the drug with the highest expectations, maybe in, in many, many, many years, other than PD-1s. Um, some people out there think this could be a $10 billion drug, so um, it's got super high expectations. Um, and uh, launch is going pretty good, but you know, again, it's really, it's really tough to, uh, to, to tell. Um, the hemophilia stocks are doing really well, so that actually brought me to let me add another overvalued into here called uh, BioVerative. So this is a company that spun out of Biogen. They have two hemophilia drugs, BioVerative, and um, basically the the Sangamos, Sparks, and Unicures are going to put, I think, put BioVerative out of business. Um, now, BioVerative has a new drug from True North, which was a really exciting acquisition. 
any smart orphan drug company should have bought True North. Uh, BioVeritiv only paid um, uh, roughly uh, uh, 400 million, and that drug is probably worth like two or three billion. So it might save BioVeritiv's bud, but it, it's worth seven billion right now. And all of their drugs are long-acting hemophilia drugs, where um, Spark, Unicure, Sangamo, maybe even Shire are going to put those drugs out of business. Uh, I wouldn't take those drugs every week if I could just take the cure one time. So we'll definitely see uh, what happens there. Um, so BioVeritiv could be could be a pretty good short there. Um, I definitely want to do a little bit more work on macrogenics, see if that's uh, more merits more of an investment. Um, I like kind of my hemophilia basket. This is about 6% of the portfolio. Um, Macrogenics definitely looks interesting. Um, that's really it. Um, so that's that on the portfolio. Um, some healthcare news that I thought was interesting. Again, the Vertex miracle on ice uh, continues. Sarepta had a really good quarter, although I thought it was going to be expected. So I'm a little ticked off that the stock has, has gone up. Um, again, I wanted to buy the stock. It looked really cheap to me. It's still probably pretty cheap. Ironwood had this terrible GERD data. So GERD is a fancy word for, uh, it's a gastrointestinal efflux uh, uh, disorder, uh, I think. Uh, gastrointestinal reflux, it's, it, gastroesophageal reflux disorder. It's basically heartburn. And uh, heartburn is not a, a, a big problem in America. And uh, Ironwood still wants to spend millions of dollars on it. And I think uh, it's kind of pathetic and that's why we're short it. So anyway, uh, Pernix had some good data. I'm not good out, I'm sorry. Um, Pernix had their refinancing and that company's in such a mess. Again, if, if uh, it takes five minutes to just do the calculation, but it's a 30 million equity and 300 million in debt. So the equity is, is basically worthless. People trade it and ask me about it all the time. Um, and there's other companies like that, like Mankind, where if you look at Mankind, um, their debt is trading at, uh, let's take a look here. Well, it's not, uh, maybe it's not, um, trading anymore but basically um, you know anytime you have a situation like Valiant or Concordia where the debt is more interesting than the equity don't don't trade the equity you know uh, and Pernix is one of those situations in tech uh, Google Glass is back and they're gonna focus on enterprise which is, is kind of an interesting perspective they're using it for factory workers um, so interesting to see them stick to it on on AR uh, Google Hire is their new kind of LinkedIn competitor that sort of um, fits together with what I'm doing um, uh, on the enterprise software side, so I thought that was interesting. I mentioned SAP and Microsoft, uh, and Netflix, again, continues to be a fascinating sort of company. So it's a pretty short one. Um, I got a lot of bad questions. Again, I'm not sure if I'm just in a bad mood, uh, but I got a ton of bad questions. Uh, Byron asked why my Bitcoin position is 0, 0.00. It's actually because uh, it's like 0, if I, if I, did, I round it off, but I have like, a few thousand dollars of Bitcoin. So it's like a really small investment. And Coinbase kicked me out, um, I think because of my, my, cert, my some of my legal issues. So they, they're nervous about having me as a client. So that's basically kind of what's going on with, with why I have such little Bitcoin. I'd like to have more. Uh, I'd like to make it about 1% of my portfolio, which is about a million dollars. Um, but I don't know where I can buy a million dollars of Bitcoin easily or safely or how I would do it. So I'm going to slowly increase it over time. But Coinbase kicked me out. So I need a new player. Um, Tim asked me about the PBMs. I haven't followed the PBMs in a while. I'm going to soon. Um, like I said, I'm starting to look at HMOs again. So um, there's that. Um, I'm reading The Hard Thing About Hard Things, which is a great book about entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurs, tech, Etc. written by Ben Horowitz. Um, so, uh, um, you know, um, we'll see. Um, I also finished the Sam Zell book. It's, uh, it's a, a really good uh, book. Uh, it's called uh, Am I Being Too Subtle? It's like most biographies, it's, it's pretty uh, trite and kind of, um, I don't know, self-promotional. But, um, you know, it was a fun read anyway. Um, it's really easy to read. You can read in like two days. Um, so uh, my Twitter spokesperson got banned right away, so you can't tweet at me. But um, if you want to um, work for me, you can actually email me a resume, martin at 
T H O T P A T R O L dot com. Um, that's my email. I'm looking to hire at least a few people to help manage um, some money for me, my partners, and my family, um, and uh, help uh, run some of the companies that I'm managing. You can sign up for Godel Systems, uh, godel.systems. There's a lot more information on there now. It used to be kind of like under wraps and secret, but there's quite a bit lot more information on godel.systems right now, and you can sign up for a beta. Thank you so much for joining. I really appreciate it. I'll see you guys next week.